Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you very much. It's great to be here. I hear there are some people who've been coming to the full course, so I'm going to enjoy talking to you after the lecture as well, and all of you. So for those of you who have been here for the whole course of lectures, my understanding is that in the sessions you've had so far, you've moved from pre-revolutionary cinema through the avant-garde experiments, if you like, of Eisenstein himself and into so-called socialist realism under Stalin in the 1930s. So you've traveled across a historical evolution from before the revolution to establish Stalinism and also through what we think of as a kind of cultural or stylistic evolution in Soviet cinema from the avant-garde to uh, so-called, as I say, socialist realism, to more conventional narrative sound cinema. So today I'm going to revisit that same historical span of about 20 years or thereabouts. Although I should say, for those of you who are coming to only this lecture, I'm not expecting prior knowledge. So it's good that I'm revisiting the same span. Um, I'm going to revisit the same span, but I'm going to do so through um, a very particular lens. So to think about how film over that 20 year period was co-opted into a much broader Soviet socialist project, which was, if you like, nothing less than the idea that it might be possible to create new people with new bodies and new minds. Because it's very important, I think, to remember when we're thinking about the Soviet um, cultural project, indeed, even in terms of how we understand it now and the difficulty of kind of navigating its legacy in contemporary Russia, it's very important to understand that project um, as seeing the revolution in social and economic structures as intrinsically and necessarily linked to, the revolution, to a revolution in, in human experience itself. So in my book that Nat Natasha was talking about, I'm thinking about um, how the social and economic revolution was supposed to be accompanied by a sensory revolution. You literally feel the world differently. But broadly tonight, we're just going to be talking about new people and new things. And film, which was a relatively new technological medium in 1917, seemed to Soviet ideologues and um, filmmakers alike to have particular potential in this project. It's a kind of technological way of seeing the world differently, and it has a way of acting on the human body and the human mind. And the Russians weren't the only people that were excited by this. So it has a potential also in its kind of effect on the spectator to be co-opted to this idea of creating new people. So we can trace the reverberations of this overarching project in all sorts of areas of Soviet culture and ideology. And I'm going to look today at how it changed according to shifting ideological priorities into the 1930s. But um, as an overarching statement, we'd say that, I'd say that Soviet um, culture during the 20s and 30s created a remarkably precise set of rules, if you like, or, or a conception of what an ideologically correct life might look like a systematic idea of how to live as a model citizen. And its tentacles spread right into the very minutiae of human existence. In fact, that's, I think, where the particularity of the Soviet experiment is at its most marked, the desire to make teapots that would create revolutionary people. Yeah, and that's, that's part of the particularity of the Soviet experiment. So we're sort of talking about two twin ideas, um, that of Novoy Buit, the new everyday life, and the Novoy Chalagyev, and I'm just giving you um, a sense that you know, artists such as Vladimir Tatlin, who, if you know him, you'll know him as a sort of avant-garde artist, how even someone like Tatlin is co-opted into the project of coming up with a worker's suit, complete with a, with a plan, a, a pattern for how to make it. So what I'm going to do today is to look at a number of films that take us from the 1920s into the 1930s, and I'm going to focus on the representation of bodies and of things, and the relationship between the two of them. So why bodies and why things? Essentially, this is reacting to new, um, or to two core ideological precepts or assumptions about how Soviet society had to be different from capitalism, which is that the bourgeois or capitalist body, as in, I hate to suggest, yours, um, was uh, unhealthy in Soviet propaganda. I'm no longer talking about yours. Corpulent, uh, unduly sexualized, corrupted by its desire for material objects. That's the, the sort of idealized, or non-idealized, the kind of ideological notion of what the capitalist body might look like, which the Soviet body has to be different from. And secondly, that that capitalist body has a misguided, commodity-based, acquisitive relationship with stuff. Yeah, we want to own things, we think of them as commodities, and we've ruptured somehow, 
Soviet ideology would suggest, the sort of innate relationship we ought to have with the world that surrounds us. That's what's gone wrong in capitalism. So these are two notions of what's gone wrong in capitalism shape um, <clears throat> the misguided socialist capitalist subject and are the basis against which the new Soviet subject has to be constructed. So the idea then of a healthy body as a cornerstone of a new ideologically healthy social system was very powerful in only Soviet Russia. And I've given you a quotation on the handout here from Leon Trotsky from 1923. I could have chosen many, many of them, but this is one of the most memorable. He says that because of revolution, man will become immeasurably stronger, more intelligent and supple. His body will become more harmonious, his movements more rhythmic, his voice more musical. This is also a way, this, this kind of regulation of the body is a way of overcoming what I've described as our unruly drives, if you like, our feelings also, our emotions. As Ziga Vertov put it in the second quotation, the psychological, and according to Soviet propaganda, Western capitalist culture was overly preoccupied with feelings. Remember, this is the time of Freud, for example. The psychological prevents man from being as precise as a stopwatch. It interferes with his desire for kinship with the machine. So in contrast, then, the new socialist body would be healthy, honed, and transformed by this so-called kinship with machines. So to give you a sense of this, and because this is a lecture about film, I'm going to show you a clip from Eisenstein's first feature film, Stachka Strike, from 1924. Eisenstein's early films, I'm sure many of you know this already, were particularly um, remarkable for his refusal to have individual heroes or indeed individual stars in them. So in this way, they're very making, their production process sought to affirm the principle of collectivity. There is no place for film stars in the Soviet collective, therefore I will make films that don't have film stars, but also to affirm or try to seek out, if you like, a vision of what this new socialist person might look like. So um, Eisenstein used untrained actors, and he sought, as I say, to use film to capture what he thought of as the unique phenomenon of the revolutionary masses. So I'm going to show you this clip, and I'd like you to think about the representation of bodies in the clip, um, and also about the relationship between the, the bodies of these unnamed heroes and their um, and machines. The plot's very simple. Essentially, um, there's going to be the workers are repressed, and they are about to revolt. And the clip you're going to see is about is the planning, if you like, of the revolt. So hopefully, is that too loud? messages inciting revolution in their, amidst their machinery. Okay, so can you see that? Are you all right? Yeah, are you sure? Um, so those unidentified types, I mean, that, that what you saw is very, is typical, yeah? You can't see the faces particularly. You're not identifying with the individuals, rather with a cohort. We're not allowed, if you like, psychological access to the characters, but we get what we get instead, I think, very powerfully, is access to their kind of embodied experience, yeah? The leg as it descends into the factory, the movement around 
the machines of the factory. What's also significant, I think, is a, a kind of ideological um, argument about machines and how machines and factories will work in the Soviet context. So if in the Western context the machine might be seen as an agent for um, the repression, if you like, of the human body, the mechanization of the human body on Ford's production lines, here, this is the space for revolutionary energy. This is where you find your energy. This, these machines incite the bodies of the, of the insurgents to their strike. And throughout the film, the healthy bodies, I mean, these are other clips, the, the healthy bodies of the workers are contrasted to, as I warned you, the corpulent, diseased or unhealthy bodies of the capitalist. You might think about the notion of revolutionary ease with physicality and um, capitalist dis-ease or disease, that, that association between the unhealthy body and then a sort of uncomfortable body. And this um, opposition goes on all the way through the film, such that healthy physicality is a designator, if you like, of ideological purity. The communist body is a healthy body. And moreover, the communist body exists in this productive relationship, this kinship with the machines of production. So if technology was an agent of oppression in capitalist Russia, in capitalist Russia, as I say, or in the capitalist West, in Soviet Russia, it liberates you. So the kinship, this notion of the kinship between the human and the machine was part of a broader emphasis on the idea of the regulation or harmonization of the unpredictable human body. So the human body should become as efficient as a machine. And I'm going to keep emphasizing that this is not a rhetoric of repression. You know, for us, it sounds really um, hideous and, and problematic. And one, one might argue that it became so. I wouldn't necessarily argue against that. But I do want to emphasize the extent to which this is seen and I think genuinely understood as a notion of liberation um, in this early period. So we eliminate unnecessary movement. As I've said in Soviet Russia, this was actually influenced by the um, production lines of Ford and Taylor in the US, but where it, for Ford and Taylor in the US, according to the Russians, it was an agent of repression. Here, the study of how the human body might be more, made more efficient on a production line, that study goes on through the 1920s in Soviet Russia and is described, again, as part of this quest for the maximized, if, maxima, maximal efficiency of the human body. Um, I've given you a quotation here from uh, Tiga Vertov, the uh, filmmaker, another core member of the Soviet avant-garde. Vertov um, <clears throat> writes, our path from the bumbling citizen through the poetry of the machine to the perfect electric man the new man, liberated from unwieldiness and unawkwardness with the precise light movements of the machine, will be the graceful object of our filming. So, Vertov made films all the way through the 20s, but his most famous film is Man with a Movie Camera from 1929. And in that film, we can trace very clearly, I think, the contours of this new Soviet body. So, the film overall was billed as a, just a day in the life of uh, a Soviet uh, city, or an, the eponymous Man with a Movie Camera who moves around, he's a roving camera and operator, moving around an unnamed city. And if you like, joyously exploring the potentialities both of film and of the new Soviet every day. So it's a celebration of um, what is supposed to have been achieved in Soviet Russia by 1929. Now, in the section that I'm going to show you, which begins um, uh, with a title, which I haven't shown you, shown on a newspaper about sport and its benefits, Vertov is exploring the relationship between the camera and the body, and its subject matter is physkultura, so physical exercise. Physkultura became a kind of continual trope. In fact, I think you may have done an exhibition at some point yeah. in Grad. Yes. Well, there we are. You will, <laughs> exactly. There is, a, there is a sort of trope that runs right the way through the Soviet period of shared exercise, to the point where really until um, the breakup of the Soviet Union, there was um, national exercise time on the radio, yeah, that everyone participates in. Um, so, so that notion of physkultura is central to the way um, that Eisenstein, that uh, Vertov rather, is exploring the body in this clip. This is silent, as I slightly think that silent film should be for you. <laughs>
not also quite going to show you about swimming. So there's also this. Yeah? Actually, she's not. I just, I just wanted to show you the mud on the faces before I stop that clip. <coughs> so, alongside, I'm interested in the fact that alongside those, you know, very regimented um, movements, symmetrical movements of the body, there are also these kind of unruly bodies at the end of the film. Pleasure, you know, taking pleasure and slathering themselves in mud in, in the beach. This is, not, this is not an ideologically coded image. Um, okay, so what, what can we say about that clip? An emphasis on, on youth as older people um, watch the displays of youthful ability. Although youth is watching youth, but also there is this kind of age difference. Those displays of youthful ability, of, of youthful bodies. And then, of course, the camera in slow motion, its capacity to show you in new ways, how the body operates, yeah, that capacity, and this was again not unique to Soviet Russia, um, across uh, America, Europe at this time, there was a notion that for the first time we could actually understand the body in motion through, due to the, due to the camera in particular. In Soviet Russia, though, this is tied to a kind of playful, in this film, uh, engagement with the relationship between movement and stillness. It also seems to revel in the geometry of bodies, as I said, the movement of the legs, etc., which is something that we saw in Eisenstein's um, Stajko in relation to the machines. But not only the geometry of bodies, I think. We have rhythmic legs, but we also have unruly or pleasurable smothering of bodies in mud. What's interesting, though, is how for, for Vertov, I think, throughout that film, bodies are implicitly desexualized, and this is important. The purpose of the camera is to bring us as spectators into a sort of heightened sensory um, understanding of experience, of what it's like to be a young person in the new world. And those bodies exist primarily as a display of shared physicality, the shared experience of being a part of the new world. Um, before I move on to talk about things, I just wanted to give you um, a sense of how this idea of the, the kind of mechanized body, but also the relationship between mechanization and emancipation, spread its tentacles um, also into the work of Sibold Meerhold, who was an acting, uh, was a director, theatre director, and who devised a very precise system of exercises for his actors to, to use his training. So where Stanislavski had focused, as many of you I'm sure will know, on the idea of the actor developing the kind of inner emotional life of his characters, famously through his work with Chekhov. Yeah? The idea that an actor must rehearse the off-stage life of a character, must understand how a character would react in particular emotional situations. Mayerhold believed this was a complete misunderstanding of where the power of acting came. It's all in the body and in the, the, the relationship of the body as, as if to a machine. Yeah? So, he, so a shift from emotion to body, from Stanislavski to Mayerhold. Um, mirrors the kind of shift that I'm describing in general. So much then for uh, bodies, but I promised also to talk about things, because Soviet ideologues were more than aware that bodies could only be transformed by transforming their social, physical, and domestic environment. And the next film I'm going to talk about is all about living space and domesticity. But before we talk about it, I think there are two points to make. The first is that the abolition of family life and all that it entailed was a core element of Soviet early utopianism. So there's a particularly kind of feminist agenda here, as Lenin pointed out, and it's a good thing, I think, that I'm giving this talk in the week of International Women's Day, which was, incidentally, a huge festival throughout um, Soviet Russia. Um, Lenin, notwithstanding all the liberating laws that have been passed, woman continues to be a domestic slave because petty housework crushes stangles, stultifies and degrades her, chains her to the kitchen and to the nursery and wastes her labour on barbarously unproductive, petty, nerve-wracking, stultifying and crushing drudgery. So um, this notion of that, that Soviet revolution should do away with old family structures, would create instead a new kind of social organisation, a collective form of social organisation, led in the first decade after the revolution to all sorts of... Um, experimental, utopian, or some might say dystopian models of family uh, life, child rearing, etc. 
particular sexual emancipation, the notion of that it was not necessary to have a single partner, the idea that children could be reared collectively. It, there's a sort of spectrum of experimental utopianism, as you might think about it, in the 1920s. The second point I want to make is related to the first, but kind of distinct, which is that underlying the idea that Soviet revolution would bring about a liberation for women and men from domesticity was the idea that domesticity was kind of materially encapsulated in stuff, in paraphernalia, in the things that we fill our houses with, sofas, squishy sofas, double beds, houseplants and ornaments, the superfluous objects, if you like, of capitalism. And remember, this is, you know, this is not, again, unique to Soviet Russia. This is the reaction on the part of modernism, if you like, to late Victoriana. Yeah? But it's here, again, that I think the Soviet project is particularly intriguing. Because that idea of a new everyday life called for the total remaking of the physical environment in the sense of furniture, crockery, and clothing. Um, I've given you here just a sense of... One, one could do many more lectures on just this. Um, but this is where, sort of, if you like, the avant-garde artists move in the 1920s into the design of the material environment. So, Rodchenko's design, design, um, design for a workers' club, his partner, in fact, Stefanova, um, designs for sports clothes. One could talk much more about this. But um, <clears throat> what I want to flag now is just that, that there was this part of what was called a campaign against domestic trash, literally called that, as in the newspaper Komsomolskaya Pravda launched such a thing, a campaign against domestic trash. The poet Mayakovsky made a, wrote a, a, a great poem in 1920 called On Trash, and he, um, he describes, quite a long poem, and he describes um, a domestic interior of so-called new Soviet people. Yeah, they look right, they look good, they've got a photograph, a poster, of, a, paint, a picture of Marx on the wall, they are ostensibly right, but they also have um, a canary, a gilded canary in a cage, and various other um, signs that show that they're not entirely reconstructed. And at the end of the poem, the, the canary memorably starts, oh, sorry, Marx memorably starts howling in horror um, about the canary, so that, and he calls out, we must break away all these structures so that communism not be destroyed by a canary. Yeah, so this notion of domestic paraphernalia as that which is getting in the way of the transformation. You know, what's, why is, why is, what, what's holding us back from becoming new people? is a really powerful idea. Um, so the project then of Novoibuit, of new everyday life, is that of remaking everyday, um, of making, remaking everything that surrounds you. But that's the ideology. What about the reality of the 1920s? I suspect those of you who come to all the courses talked a little bit with, about this with Ian Christie earlier. The reality of the 1920s was one of extraordinary difficulty for real men and women in Soviet cities. So all the time that Eisenstein is making his ideological celebratory films, the reality of the 1920s is one of much greater ideological complexity. The bottom line was that in the 1920s, in order for the Soviet state to recover itself economically, Lenin and his team permitted a certain amount of economic flexibility. So private industry was completely acceptable. You could sell whatever you wanted on the street corners, for example. And this brings about a sort of complex relationship between the slogans and the idea of what reality is supposed to be like, and then how the everyday is being lived by people. Similar problem with massive overcrowding and housing shortages. People flooding to the cities, finding nowhere to live. And it's this kind of messy, chaotic, confusing everyday that provides the subject matter for an awful lot of what we might think of as sort of popular comedies um, through the 1920s. The, um, you can sort of think about the ideal of the transformation of everyday life ending up more as a distortion of everyday life. You know, it's confusing, it's changed, but it's not, it's not working at this point. So Abram Room's um, Bed and Sofa, which is the next film I'm going to talk about, is a particularly um, intriguing kind of film about this. Uh, a film which tackles directly... Um, Everyday life. You can see that in its title. So it's called in Russian Pleasure Mishanska, which is the name of a street, but also Mishanska means bourgeoisness. Um, so it's the name of a real street in Moscow that kind of works for his purposes. But it was also known as bed and sofa. And it's worth you knowing that the bed and the sofa were particularly kind of potent, laden uh, items symbolically in terms of what needed to be got rid of in order to make Soviet society as opposed to capitalist society. <clears throat> 
um, particularly the double bed, um, as we'll see here. So quickly placing the, context, the film in context with you, it's released in 1927 by Abraham Room. Uh, that date's important. Um, 1926 to 1928 is a moment of big um, self-re-evaluation on the part of Soviet filmmaking. So why? Because it's coming up to a 10-year anniversary of the revolution, but also of Soviet cinema. Um, and there's a lot of, there are a lot of issues to be addressed. Eisenstein and other members of the so-called avant-garde have been making these new revolutionary types of film. But there are issues about the popularity and indeed the comprehensibility of these films for the very audience that they're trying to reach, the new proletariat. In the meantime, um, a lot of American films are being shown in Russia right the way through the 1920s. Douglas um, Fairbanks, Mary Pickford, huge tour, mobbed on the streets in Moscow. So you have, again, that same conflict between ideolo ideology, ideal, and reality. And there's, so there's a gap, if you like, between the kind, of the kind of films that the audience wants to see and the films that are being made by the Soviet film industry. And it's that gap that um, the Soviet film industry sets out to fill in this period asking for films about real Soviet everyday life. But of course, it's not that simple. They also are supposed to be films showing how real Soviet everyday life could be bettered, improved, how it ought to be. So Rum was a major director um, already by this time. And the screenplay of the film was made by Viktor Shklovsky. So this was a, who was a leading uh, formalist literary critic, an important cultural figure. So this was an important film and, and put under a lot of scrutiny. And its stated purpose was, as Rum says here, um, to use real words where so far all we've heard is giggling and lisping. So to really engage directly with not the, the, the ideal, but rather the reality of what the Soviet everyday looks like in 1927, and therefore to try and kind of suggest how it might improve. So the plot of the film is a, a young couple um, living and working in Moscow. He goes off to work every day on a construction site. She stays at home. They live in a basement, so she stays at home underground. Um, one of his friends arrives in the city to look for work, but can't find anywhere to live because of the housing problems, so ends up taking up a residence on their sofa in their very small apartment. And a, a ménage à trois ensues, essentially, because after a while it's the husband who ends up on the sofa because his friend <laughs> manages to take her out of the flat, which really the husband hadn't managed to do for some time, and show her the city, which is very exciting. So they just swap, and it's fairly amicable at this point, and the husband's on the sofa. Uh, and she eventually gets pregnant, and then the two men want her to abort the baby because babies are, as we know, unruly, uncomfortable, they change your life. So she heads off to a very clinically... Um, impressive, clean-looking abortion clinic, sits there and then leaves, gets up and leaves, and doesn't leave just the abortion clinic, but leaves Moscow and heads off on a train. And the film ends with her heading off who knows where, and the two men sitting still on the sofa making themselves a cup of tea rather than having Ludmila make them a cup of tea. So I'm going to show you a fairly long clip um, from the beginning of the film, um, because I think it gives you... <coughs> this is the beginning, so it gives you the sense of the arrival in Moscow, of what Moscow looks like, and then also of their apartment.
different trains, and so in a film like that, it's a train moving around. This is a real symbol of energy, dynamism, all that's to be celebrated. But we already know that it's going towards a sleeping city. Yeah? So there's already a kind of contrast here. <laughs> picture don't you? So he's reading the workers newspaper while being served tea by his wife. Not quite up to scratch. So, 
There's a, lot, there's a lot we could talk about there. We could talk extensively, actually, about the city, which is another kind of core theme in Soviet film of this period. But I'm interested in, in domestic space, particularly. Although I think the, the way in which he arrives in Moscow and the way in which Moscow is configured as a, as a space, as a, as a city of old buildings, is part of that, um, of how the film is kind of asking questions about whether the new world has yet been built. So it matters that... Nikolai is, he go, when he goes off on his day job, he is a construction worker. He is building the new world. But this man who's building the new world is living very much in a kind of hybrid space, which is both the old and the new. So much of the film takes place in that very small apartment. And there was lots of um, innovation, actually, in the set design of this film in order to enable them to give um, that sense of claustrophobia and sort of three-dimensional claustrophobia that surrounds the spectator. And the whole film takes place in condensed um, space and time. And as I say, it's only the men who leave the apartment, really. And so the physical form of the film, in that sense, reflects its theme, which is the, that of entrapment, that Ludmila, in particular, is trapped in an old world. These are characters who ought to belong to the new, but who remain trapped in the old. You see Nikolai, at one point, doing his exercises, by a portrait of Stalin. These are some other, um, uh, these are stills from the film. Um, but that portrait of Stalin hangs incongruously against that huge melee of just simple stuff. As I said, cushions, double beds are ideologically coded in this period. So are um, houseplants. It's not an accident that the film begins explicitly with houseplants, uh, net curtains, and then um, a double bed. So they are literally trapped and metaphorically trapped. Their private space is the, the 33 square arshins that were the nominal uh, amount of space that each individual could have in Soviet Russia in this period. That's what they live in. That's what a couple is entitled to. And when Vladimir arrives and has nowhere to live, it kind of thematizes that whole problem of private space. Remember, this is a time of so-called collective living. Everybody's supposed to embrace collective living. What we end up here is a distorted version of what collective living is really like, and it's a bit squashed and not entirely satisfactory. So in all sorts of ways, this film, Bed and Sofa, is a film about the failures of the idea of the new everyday life, particularly with regard to gender. So Ludmila is trapped by bourgeois models of relationships, both of the men in her life expect her to be their servant. So a society that's proclaimed new domestic family relationships, what's it resulted in here? In fact, in the kind of looseness of morality that enables there to be the bed swap, but in nothing positive for Lyudmila at all. But it's also, I think, and more interestingly perhaps, a film about the relationship between people and things. So Luda is as trapped as much by the men in her life, or as much by objects, as she is by the men in her life. And so the film questions the extent not only to which the real, the transformation of people has been achieved, but also whether it is possible. Because it draws our attention to the extent to which our lives are kind of surrounded by, shaped by objects. <clears throat> um, what is it then, the film seems to us, that actually gets in the way of making new people a new world? These aren't bad people. You can see that from the clip that you watched. There's a lot of joy in the early parts of that film. What is it that gets in the way, the film is asking? And this is a question that became increasingly kind of potent and important in the latter half of the 1920s. Is it emotions? Or might it actually be in part stuff, the human attachment to objects, the need for comfort, old-fashioned models of living? I think it's important that in this film, when Lyudmila heads off um, on the train to nominally have her baby and to liberate herself from all of this, she doesn't actually go anywhere at all. The film isn't able to show a, pla a place that she might end up in which this new life might be possible. So at its end, I think Bed and Sofa is asking a, a much more fundamental question about whether or not the transformation of people and new every the creation of a new everyday life is possible at all, and perhaps more importantly, whether it should be possible. Now, what do we stand to lose? For the film may suggest that the ideal of a world in which the human being would be liberated from the messiness, both literal and metaphorical, of life, and in which people really can be changed, would also stand to lose things. So you might think about mess, the mess of objects, the mess of emotions in that film, as a sort of inquiry into what it means to be human. There's an awful lot that is messy about the human, 
and the film is perhaps asking, what do we stand to lose if we eliminate that? And there's just a quotation from a room there, talking about how the, the things in the film have a fate, um, a past, a present, and a future. And together they live, breathe, and interfere in people's lives, keep them in close captivity. So he's drawing our attention in the film to the extent to which we attach ourselves to and are shaped by objects. For all the subtlety of that film, though, the need to actually try and remake the relationship between people and things or to challenge the drawer of commodities remained essential. I'm just going to do a brief excursion now into a film from 1931, which was one of the very first Soviet sound films called Alone by um, Cousin Seven Trauberg, which I think you've talked about a little bit, some of you, already. It's a really interesting film. Um, I won't spend long on it now, but I just want to show you a couple of really great clips that directly raise this question of how new Soviet man or woman might deal with things. Yeah? What do we do with our desire for saucepans, literally, in this film? So the plot of the film sees a young school teacher called Kuzmina who um, has recently graduated and who is looking forward to her new life, um, the good life, in the big city with a fiancé. And the whole of the first part of the film explicitly shows these dreams of a good life and then challenges them, really. And the second half of the film sends her off to Siberia. She, having thought she'd get her first posting in Moscow, is slightly shocked. I think you might have seen this bit to discover that actually she's got to go to Siberia. But in the plot of the film, it is the simplicity of life in Siberia and, in fact, the kind of native life um, of the people in Siberia that kind of redeems her. So it's, it's very much about, you know, what is a good life? Um, I'm going to show you the first clip when she and her, her fiancé are anticipating this happy life. I understand that you know that Shostakovich wrote the music for this film, but that the, film, the, but the, the bit you heard was kind of lugubrious. So um, I'm going to play you the bit of Shostakovich's music for this film, which really is not lugubrious. So they're, they, they, they're, they're going shopping, basically. life be, life will be. How good life will be. This is her imagining herself as a teacher. With lovely, attentive children. Beautifully dressed as pioneers. that in the face of that, when she discovers shortly after this that instead of going to a lovely school in Moscow full of little pioneers, she's going to be sent to Altai, um, this is a source of some distress to her. And this, you may have seen this bit. She goes back to the shop. <clears throat> but here, her relationship with the object has radically changed. They are calling to her, yeah?
about to be a loud speaker, um, which is one of the interesting things about this as a sound film, the way that Kuznetsov uses the capacity of sound, if you like, to let the Soviet message come to her through a street loud speaker. But I don't want to talk about that. I want to just talk about the, the changing relationship with objects, or rather the way that the film pictures the kind of relationship with objects that, if you like, capitalists have. So in the second part of the film, um, the, the native uh, people from Altai that she meets are always touching, always handling, handling sheep fleeces, sewing, making boots, etc. It matters, I think, that in that scene that you just saw, where Kuzmina is being called to by the objects, that they are calling to her through a glass window. This is a kind of explicit um, engagement with the notion of what the commodity is. These are objects that can't be touched. She reaches for them, but they look back sort of intransigent. They might be calling to her, but really they are essentially untouchable. And this is a core element of how the Soviet ideologues thought about what had gone wrong with, I keep saying capitalist, but maybe I should say our relationships with objects, that we've forgotten how to feel things. Because we think of things as commodities, this is Marx, pure Marx at this point that I'm giving you, because we think of things as commodities, that's ruptured our kind of innate relationship with the material world. And that's what we see there, that she and her fiancé, it's a playful envisaging of a, of, a, of a way of life that they will live, they think they're going to be happy, but it's all wrong. It's all wrong. She needs to relinquish those objects. She needs to walk away from those objects, even as they call to her. Um, so for the rest of today, um, I just want to talk to you about films made in the 1930s under Stalin and in the period known as socialist realism. Because I think it allows us to think briefly about how um, films made in the 1930s sort of overcame all the difficulties that I've raised. I mean, essentially what we've seen is the vision of how people and, and relationships with things might be remade, and then the encounter with how that might be problematic, how that might be impossible, how both bodies and, and stuff might resist the idea of transformation. How was that transformed in socialist realist propaganda cinema? So here you need some context about what happened to Soviet film in the 1930s, and I know you've had some information about this, but for those of you coming in just today, a brief gloss. So we've talked about the challenge of finding an appropriate style for Soviet film during the 1920s. The experiments of the avant-garde were difficult in two ways. First, because the desired audience, as I've suggested, often couldn't understand the films of Eisenstein, the early films of Eisenstein, for example. Secondly, and perhaps most interestingly, because the very concept that underlay the filmmaking of Eisenstein and of Sigur Vertov, which was to use film to activate the spectator, it's the principle of montage, if you like, to kind of put um, either as shocks in the case of Eisenstein or just as exciting um, juxtapositions in the case of Vertov, to use the film to try to activate your deadened consciousnesses and turn you into socialist citizens. That very project, that idea of activating, of trying to make people think, which, for better or worse, did actually underlie the projects in the 1920s, that very idea was perhaps increasingly problematic in the 1930s, when what was really needed under Stalin was to bring together the nation in supporting the massive industrialization drives and massive drives to collectivize the countryside. So that project, that kind of utopian idea that maybe we can make people think and they'll want to be socialist citizens, failed. What happens instead in the 1930s is the reconciliation or the, the realization that um, what's needed is narrative cinema with simple messages, content over form, um, and simple stories. So in 1934, as you perhaps know, there was the announcement that henceforward the style of art would be socialist realism, which would be um, realist in form and socialist in content, essentially. Now, what did this do in cinema? In very broad terms, Soviet cinema of the 1930s became what we think of as standard narrative cinema, you know, very similar in techniques to that which was being produced in Hollywood in the period. And often, perhaps surprisingly, um, musical comedy cinema probably the, one of the most popular genres in Soviet cinema in the 1930s. And Soviet filmmakers um, were uh, exhorted to precisely use the techniques of Hollywood. So Shumyatsky, who was head of the film industry, went to Hollywood, came back saying, we need a Soviet Hollywood to use the techniques that were being developed in Hollywood. Um, and they did so. Um, they use the techniques in Hollywood, if you like, to carry their own version of the American dream, or their own version of that feel-good message that was so much a part 
of Hollywood filmmaking in the 1930s and 40s also. The Soviet dream, if you like, modifies the American dream. Seven brides for seven brothers becomes seven collective farm workers for seven metalwork metal machinery operators. And I, you know, really I'm not, this is, this is proper stuff really. Um, and the message that these films seek to convey then is that all has been achieved. So with the rhetoric in the 1920s, exemplified in the train was about movement towards the future. The rhetoric in the 1930s is that we're in the future, we are there. The whole aspect of the Soviet land has changed, the mentality of its people has been altered. The illustrious people are the builders of socialism, the workers and collective farmers. In Stalin's words, memorably, life has become better, comrades, life has become more fun. In the midst then of Soviet Russia's most intensive industrialization drive, most difficult period of rural reform, the core message was one of merriment and celebration. But what's important is that if the American dream is one of personal fulfillment, um, and I, again, I think it's really important that we see that as a propaganda project in itself. Not as much, I wouldn't make that claim, but it is definitely also a propaganda message. The American dream is that of personal fulfillment. Any individual can do anything. In the Soviet world, the individual can only achieve his fulfillment through the collective. So if you're going to get your love story, you'll only get it after you've become really good at operating a weaving machine, for example. Um, and this is a common, this is a standard narrative pattern that is repeated in films through this period. All romance and personal achievement are framed within the narrative of collective good. So as I've said, musical comedy was a particularly powerful and important genre in the 1930s. And one of the most prolific um, and important directors of the period was a man, not shown there, called Grigory Alexandrov, um, who was actually Eisenstein's co-director for October, for example. And again, you know, I, I want to really challenge the idea that what happened in the 1930s was a kind of terrible rupture with the avant-garde. It doesn't need to be seen like that, or at least we shouldn't be as simple as to see it like that. This is the same, these are often the same people. Um, uh, Grigory Alexandrov, whose wife was the blonde star of most of his films, Dubo Varlova, um, and who becomes a, the kind of the Soviet version of the film star, sort of healthy, um, blonde, robust, physical prototype. Um, uh, Alexandra made his first film in 1934, it was called The Jolly Fellows. It was celebrated by ideologues and um, politicians as a future for Soviet cinema, precisely because it was jolly. Yeah, and, and it, that was exactly what the, the Soviet regime needed at that point. Um, and in 1936, he made a film called Cirque, Circus, in which the references to Hollywood are very explicit. Um, and that's the film I want to show you now, because it has interesting things, I think, to tell us about bodies um, and Soviet configurations of them. So the film, very simple propaganda message, tells the compelling story of the American trapeze artist Marion, who has fallen um, tragically under the power of a German uh, entrepreneur, an evil German entrepreneur, so, you know. Um, he takes her to Soviet Russia for a set of performances, so she's a trapeze artist, as I say, in, his, in, 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 a, so in a Soviet circus, but they go to do their act there. While she's there, she meets and um, falls in love with, um, quite understandably, incidentally, with a remarkably handsome, uh, healthy Soviet body in the form of another trapeze artist, um, athletic, blonde, good-looking, well-toned, etc., um, and the film tracks the development of her attraction to him, but not just to him, also um, to the implicit freedom and, fulfil freeman, freedom and fulfillment um, possible in Soviet life. So in a famous scene, which is part of their love story, she learns the words to a classic um, Soviet song, which proclaims, and I've put the lyrics at the end of your little sheet, that's the only reason I really gave you a sheet, um, so that you can follow it when I play it to you later. The lyrics of the song proclaim, Wide is my native land, I know no other, no other country where man can breathe so freely. So ultimately, Marion decides that she wants to leave the circus and to break free from the imprisonment of the evil German to remain in Soviet Russia. And I'm going to show you a scene about that, but what you need to know first is why she is in his power. She's in his power because she has a black baby, and in America, she was chased out of America because of her black baby. Yeah, so there are ideological um, polarities being raised here. America is a racist country where Mar it's, it is her terrible secret in the, in the words of the, of the German 
um, uh, evil man, for want of a better word. And you will see the, the clip that I'm going to show you is usefully in English. Um, So, um, several things to, to just mention there. You know, the evening dresses are really important. Yeah, and you you could say all sorts of things. You could say this is a this is a cop out. We get the pleasure and the joy of of um, the glamorous film star in her glamorous dresses, but they are problematized in the text. Yeah, they become an issue, but we still get that visual pleasure. The same. Um, I don't have time to show you, but the same in the film. Um, with these spectacular Busby Berkeley-like um, dance routines and trapeze, and trapeze routines. I mean, all the pleasures, the visual pleasures of high Hollywood are brought into this film, but ideologically framed. Um, here, he is throwing her evening dresses at her. What she does in the, in the scene subsequent to this is she changes her name. She writes a letter. She, cha she signs her name. She crosses out uh, Marion and writes, Masha. Um, she gets rid of that extraordinary collection of beautiful evening dresses in which he had impris implicitly imprisoned her body. And she dons this kind of simple white outfit of trouser and top. But, but it doesn't, it's not straightforward because she's still, she's afraid. Um, and so her last performance, um, she thinks she's freed him herself. But, but, but what happens is that the German appears with the baby at the show in the circus ring. And... Um, there is this kind of horrifying moment. She runs out in anguish, thinking this is over. Um, and the baby, I, again, I'm not going to show you this clip now, but I'll show you what happens straight after it. The baby is taken by the um, overtly mixed race audience that happened to be in the big top, <laughs> watching the circus performance at that point, and passed from group to group. And the, a, a lullaby is sung in all the languages of the Soviet Union. So, Because, of course, we in the Soviet Union unlike America, um, accept all people. So I'm going to show you now, though, um, how the glamorous individual body of that, um, so of the Western star, which she represents, and which, as I say, is part of the film's kind of visual appeal to the Soviet consumer, how that body is transformed into um, part of the collective synchronized body of the Soviet youth. And then I'll just use a few more words and then finish. So this, so, okay, let me just stop that momentarily. So she has just learned that this has happened. So she's been brought back into the circus ring. She's been shown that no one, everybody wants to be her, her baby to be part of the great socialist family. She's still wearing at this point her kind of robe that covers her, her, um, her trapeze artist costume, as we think. And then she begins to sing this song, and you can follow the lyrics on, your, um, on the sheet if you don't know them. I wouldn't expect you to. <laughs> but you might. If you were a Russian, I mean, I don't know who's here. If you were a Russian, you probably would. It's a very, it became a very popular song.
So they're still in the circus top at this point. So why does my native land? Sorry about the quality. So the transformation that I'm showing you here is, is, is multiple, really. It is the transformation, as I say, from the individual body in clothing to the collective body in her white outfit. It, you might also think about it as the transformation from the unruly, if you like, the kind of individualized movements of the trapeze artist into, and I think it happens to you too, into the kind of rhythmic march of the music. Um, Marion moves from the circus top to taking part in a parade, of course, walking in unison with thousands of other fulfilled young Soviets, singing that famous song with her, if you like, sexualized capitalist body transformed into part of the mass body. And I put up these slides to show you how um, Moscow was replanned in the 1930s precisely to enable these kinds of mass demonstrations of what we might think of as the kind of regulated collective body which is a very particular kind of endpoint, and not, I would argue, the inevitable endpoint of the project um, that I was trying to introduce you to earlier tonight. So I've just tried to show you, um, in very kind of brief stopping off points, the evolution of bodies, and that final image um, of Marion in her, in her bland white suit kind of overcomes difference, ignores the very problems that a film such as Rooms or a film such as, um, as Alone with the Crockery um, phrases. The utopian ambitions that were visible in Eisenstein and Vertov have not come to pass. We don't have a new kind of person, but rather a kind of redressed, glamorous star. A film, this one, seeking not, I think, to liberate the bodies of the spectator, but simply to make them celebrate, to feel, if you like, given that feelings are in my title, and to celebrate the Soviet dream by enjoying its visual pleasures. That's all. Thank you for your patience.